Episode 51, The D Word. Demons, obviously, with Michelle Boulanger. Ahoy hoy, Nightmaricans. Aaron here, your host, your researcher of the weird, and also a commentator on Paranormal Caught on Camera. And the thing that I really do love about Paranormal Caught on Camera is that we have a lot of different videos from all over the world and a lot of different folklore is represented and I, and, and belief systems and whatnot. You will notice that something that comes up a lot on that show is the concept of demons. Now I, this is a tricky topic for me because I was raised Catholic and demons were apparently around every corner and my personal philosophy on it is that the idea of demons being behind all sorts of paranormal activity, it doesn't quite jive for me. And yet it is it has become something that is a bit consuming at times within the paranormal reality TV genre. But there is so much more to unpack with the idea of demons. So... If you are sensitive to this and you don't want to talk about demons, now is your time to get out. But we're going to be really getting into a, a chat about the academics and the background of what we call demons. And the person that I'm bringing in for this, I'm super excited to have her here. She is an old friend. It's been a while since we've actually seen each other, but... Uh, Michelle Belanger, and I am going to apologize in advance because since we also have Jeff Belanger in the paranormal field, I am probably going to default to Belanger at some point, and I apologize in advance. But Michelle is an occult expert, a media personality, a psychic author of more than 30 books on the paranormal and occult topics. She, You've seen her all over TV, quite honestly. Paranormal State, on Portals to Hell... She is a psychic medium and also offers classes and weekend retreats on psychic development at Inspiration House in Oberlin, Ohio. We'll talk a little bit more about that and uh, towards the end of the program as well. And that is a more than 150 year old house with very cozy, very cozy place to be. So, OK, she is also the author of the Dictionary of Demons, and it has just celebrated its 10th anniversary and has been revised and expanded. So there's a lot to unpack with that. And I, uh, and we're not even going to get to all of it because I think it's uh, she has more than 1,700 demons that she talks about in, in this book. So, okay, without further ado, Michelle, welcome to Nightmarica. Hey, thank you for having me. And don't worry about the last name. Half my family pronounces it Belanger, uh, Bellinger, and, and Belanger. I go with the pronunciation from my grandfather because that's where the name came from. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, which is funny because when I see Jeff Belanger uh, as a gag, I will say Belanger. But, mm -hmm. you know, but when it's actually when I'm actually trying to pronounce it Belanger, and I'm French, I have a lot of French blood in me. And, so yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's true. Uh, that, no, I'm, I'm just being silly at this point. <laughs> yeah, we well, the name thing is so weird with my family. I, it's the it's like the lore of the family doesn't always match up with the genetics, and mm. that's something I'm actually researching right now. But uh, but let's talk about you. Yeah, with a dictionary of demons, it came out ten years ago. You have in this book. It's. I would say that it's actually one of the most important books on demonology and incredibly important and timely. And you have not just entries, but you have articles, you have illustrations, you talk about demonology itself, and it's it's really a reference guide. So, how did you how did you decide I'm going to write? A big old book on demons. It started with a conversation between me and Father Bob, uh, actually between episodes on Paranormal State. Uh, if folks watched Paranormal State in the early, like especially for first season, there was a whole mystique 
around the name Belial, where they wouldn't even say it on camera. They would like, like show it up in little letters so you could guess what the name was. And there was this sort of holy dread of, of speaking the name out loud. And as somebody who took demonology from Jesuits uh, as part of my undergrad uh, work at, at John Carroll, I, I was like, the names actually give you power over them, not the other way around. So uh, Father Bob was lamenting uh, not having a list of the names easily at hand because a significant part of the tradition of exorcism is you have the name of the demon and you then abjure them, you constrain and uh, banish them in that name. So that name is sort of like your magical talisman for power over the demon. Uh, which makes, uh, as a Catholic priest, having a list of names fairly handy if part of your job is running around doing exorcisms for, for families that feel that they're under demonic oppression or possession. And I also am a gamer and a writer of fiction and had had a fascination with this stuff for, for many years prior to that, just from, from an academic and a folkloric standpoint. So I, I already had a spreadsheet of names that I'd collected from things, so it wasn't the hardest thing to be like, oh, hey, well, well, can you read the Latin? Uh, and I, I do. Um, I, read, I read Latin, French. I muddle my way through Italian and Spanish. Um, I know just enough German to know I don't know German. Hmm. Uh, but many of the resources that these names are drawn from are from um, Middle Ages and Renaissance Europe. Uh, and if they're not in Latin, they're in the above languages. Some of them are in Hebrew. I sourced that out because I'm not even going to pretend that I know that. Um, I recognize maybe three Hebrew letters and that's about it. Um, so Father Bob was like, hey, it would be handy if there was a book that was just all the names of these things to, to help in what I'm doing. And I'm like, I could do that. <laughs> Actually, that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, and and honestly, for me, it, it, it was like, I, I love research. I love reading. Um, it's something I don't get to kind of wheel out on a lot of the television shows because honestly, they like my work as a, as a medium because it's a little flashier. Uh, and this let me like really dig back into my, my academic background, which again, doesn't come out a whole lot, but, uh, you know, National Merit Scholar and, and everything like this. This is a big part of my personality. Yeah. I don't own like 5,000 books for nothing. Yeah, the the notion of the academic when it comes to reality TV, uh, academic and smart are not sexy when it comes to uh, the viewpoint of, of some of these producers. Um, and that's oftentimes an unfortunate situation. Well, well I think partly it's because many academics get so stifled in academia that they forget how to talk to people outside of it. <laughs> and, and, and that is feedback that I've gotten for any of the documentary work that I've done, which I have, like, I, I just, I abandoned the like, okay, I can't say I completely abandoned all the big words, but there was a point where it occurred to me that like what we were being taught to do in academia was to speak over people's heads in a way that felt more performative than useful. Mm -hmm. And I sort of rebelled against that. That's also why I'm not in academia anymore, because the purpose of learning, uh, in my opinion, is to share the information to as wide an audience as possible, which is also why this isn't an academic text. It's a text that's got like little bits to help guide you through like key concepts of like, you know, okay, what, what, what do goats have to do with all of this stuff? Like why do goats mm -hmm. and goat imagery keep popping up and what's with uh, the, the, the black man at the crossroads and is there racism in there? Spoiler. Yes. Um, and then just all of the stuff that we have to unpack in this really dense uh, inherited tradition of, of the demonic and, and of evil spirits that have come down to us. Yeah. And that's, that's what I was going to say is that this is not, this is not some sort of, um, this is not like a, um, a, a, uh, a industry book or a trade book. This is not just for people that are in the biz of, of demonology or demons or whatever. This is a very accessible text for anyone that wants to learn. And really, I would say, demystify is sort of the word that I would use and mm -hmm. maybe it's not totally accurate but make you know bring it down to earth really quite yeah. honestly well yeah and, and it's not meant to be a theological text right one of the things that I tried very hard to avoid is to present 
how to believe about these to anyone. I, I focus on uh, the folklore, the mythology, um, you know, redactions of the literature and just show here's all the sources and you can decide, dear reader, like where you take this from here. Well, what are demons? Let, let's start there. <laughs> oh, see, that's that's a hard thing to answer, actually, because there's the pop culture uh, mm -hmm. idea of demons, like what we understand to be demons. Um, in many ways has been shaped by books, television, movies. And I would say that where we are at right now, our understanding of demons owes an awful lot both to uh, the 1973 Exorcist, as well as Ed and Lorraine Warren's work. Yeah. Um, and, and like there is an unavoidable legacy from, from, from all of that and kind of like the stories that have been picked up and especially fiction. Um, movies that have presented the ideas of demons and exorcism. So all of that is very much from a predominantly Christian point of view, where demons are damned beings that are these scions of darkness in a kind of like locked war between darkness and light, and the stakes are the souls of humanity. Um, and that presumes a certain worldview uh, between, you know, God and Satan, or the devil, or Lucifer, multiple names there, and it's not always clear if they're the same guy, which is fun to kind of go digging in. Now, where the word comes from is important. Um, when the early Christian literature was being recorded as scripture, a good portion of it was recorded in Greek. The Greek word daemon, daemonis, um, usually rendered in English D-A-I-M-O-N or D-A-E-M-O-N is slightly different from what we now understand as a demon. Uh, so the Greek demonis, there were broadly two types, eudemonis and cacodemonis. And eudemonis were good demons, and cacodemonis were not bad demons, they were chaos demons. And, and that's a, a pretty pointed distinction. So in their worldview, pre-Christian, everyone could have a personal demon. And demons in their language were not necessarily evil. They were different. They were uh, spirit beings. They were kind of between, they were above humans, but they were below the gods. And uh, probably the best example of like how the ancient Greeks approached the idea of demons is Socrates, um, the philosopher that most people know about for having to take hemlock as a punishment for corrupting the youth of Athens with uh, his, his strange ideas about philosophy and, and analytical thinking. He was also uh, um, a hell of a time traveler. Um, <laughs> if, if my own academic studies serve me well, the great Socrates. Um, but uh, yes, okay. sorry, go on. I, I had an uncle who, who legit pronounced it Socrates too because he was a read not said kind of person, autodidact. Uh, but but so Socrates believed in a personal demon. He had one. It had guided him through his life. He wrote about it. Um, and on the occasion of his sentencing, prior, prior to his death, he makes a comment that his, his death is not going to necessarily be a bad thing because in all other cases, his demon would turn him away from something that was bad, that was going to actually harm him. And that day in the morning when he got up for his execution, his demon was silent. His demon didn't tell him it was a bad thing. So he took it to mean death wasn't going to be the end of him and neither was it going to be a bad experience in the end. Uh, but, but that he worked clearly with this. And I would say that from a modern perspective, uh, the ancient Greek idea of a demon was closer to what we think of as spirit guides. Yeah. Which is quite different from how that word gets used, especially throughout um, not only the New Testament, but as we kind of backwards translate things. Yeah, the where we yeah, sorry. Oh no, just like where automatically, yeah, the 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 pop culture component. I mean, even before the Exorcist, but certainly the Exorcist, the Warrens, the Satanic Panic. We got into this yeah. this time of demon is automatically a bad thing. Obviously, I think that that had been a, an association for a long time. But yeah. even but okay, before we get to the modern era, let's stick with Greece a little bit. And and because before then, we also have these entities existing in 
like first millennia uh, BCE or whatever, right? In these in Sumeria and and Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia. Yeah. It and and okay. So the idea of um, a malevolent spirit is incredibly old, probably as old as humanity. And our ideas here in Western civilization, uh, while we get the word demon largely from Greek, and it's important to note that because we kind of project it backwards over time. So when we see something that sort of loosely fits the idea of a non-human, malevolent, uh, evil spirit, fallen angel, it gets labeled demon. Like when we're translating that from any other culture's language, demon is the word that we use. It's important to recognize that when that's oversimplifying things because it's a really it's a menagerie of things back there. Like there's so much stuff going on. We're, we're talking about like the, the angry, evil children of gods, um, legitimately fallen angels, uh, spirits that are just the anthropomorphic version of uh, sandstorms and uh, earthquakes, diseases. So when we go into the ancient world, uh, there's a couple of things that are really worth noting. Our idea of possession and exorcism uh, are relatively unchanged from Sumer on down. So like the, the realm of Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, the Christians got most of their demonology from the Jews. The Jews got most of their demonology from um, the Babylonians and Sumerians and with a whole lot of other like culture exchange as well. And, and I can't leave out the Muslims who are additionally, so anybody, any of the people of the book, uh, their ideas are influenced by the cultural milieu of the ancient Greeks, the Coptic Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, and then a plethora of ancient Middle Eastern societies from um, you know Babylon on down. In Sumeria, uh, there are texts called the Maklu texts, the burning texts, and they had a specific uh, order of priests that their, their sole purpose really was to perform exorcisms. But to understand what they meant by exorcisms, if you read through the texts, medicine and magic at that time period are, are intertwined. You can't separate them. And so the name of a demon was often in that culture. It was essential to exorcism. It was essential to diagnosing what was going on with the person. It was also a medical diagnosis in most cases. So literally the names of these demons back then were tetanus, migraine, uh, diphtheria, like, like, and if you're translating the words literally, the given names, you, you realize that in many cases, what they're seeing as a demon is epilepsy, is mm -hmm. mental illness, is, is something. And this is where it gets really complicated because a lot of the symptoms that are then indicative of demonic possession sound like medical symptoms sound like mental illness symptoms. mental illness yeah because back then there was no separation whatsoever yeah i mean even when we read the the christian biblical texts of jesus casting out a a demon it if you read it more as not a demon but somebody somebody having a seizure or somebody suffering from some, some mental illness then it tracks that way yeah the the uh, but these and correct me if I'm wrong, but these demons in these in the ancient times they weren't necessarily all bad and they weren't black or white. It, it, good, bad, white hat, black hat. One demon could be a protector or you know be the bane of your existence. Is that correct? Like were they pretty fluid in their identity? Yeah, it's something that gets lost pretty significantly. Um, probably th there's two really good examples for that. Um, in ancient Egyptian uh, mythology, there were demons, and we don't have a better word to translate these entities, um, each assigned to one of the decans of the zodiac. So there's like 36 little star clusters. It's um, kind of proto-astrology, astronomy. And these demons were the things that caused certain disasters and illness and, and other like um, bad fate for humans, but they were also the ones that you would reach out to to cause those things not to happen to you. So they were in charge of them. So they were both the curer and the causer. 
in that idea that sort of dual nature where they have control over an illness. So they're the one that you go to because they're causing it. They're the one that you find some way to get them to make it go away. Like it, it, it's a really hard to wrap your head around concept. I think at this point, if we're looking back from, from the lens of the future, mm -hmm. um, Pazuzu is probably the best example of that. Uh, where he was, uh, he's, he's a demon, but he's a demon of possession, which is to say that he's the dude that you reach out to, to try to get everybody else to back off. Like if somebody is being attacked, you reach out to Pazuzu, he's protective. Uh, and yeah. that's not how he gets picked up and, and portrayed. Uh, partly because he's, you know, he's very scary looking, like he's, he's this weird kind of hybrid thing. A lot of the stuff from back then is giant uh, uh serpent penis as well correct yeah, is yeah. that i mean that's pretty that's intimidating like no that's that that's a theme like there's how, how do i put it the ancient people were a little more earthy about some <laughs> things than, than we might be now and and of course before i i mean i want to hear more about pazuzu but um you know we have this the uh image of him again going back to the exorcist film you know, uh, Max von Sydow is is digging up uh, in uh, is he in Afghanistan, I believe, yeah. and he finds this this little statue of Pazuzu, and this is really where you know shit gets real, hits the fan, and then bounces from there to Reagan, and it's all connected. So it's all yeah. it's all bad stuff. This is all evil. This is a bad guy. Pazuzu is a bad demon and connected to hell. But that you're saying that's not that's not the Pazuzu we know or we should know. It, it's it's not the full story. And and that's also the case with a lot of the the classic demons from back then. Uh, you either have beings where we are, our best word for them is demon, but that erases the concept of also being in charge of fixing the problem that they cause. It's, we, we're such a black and white, and I think mm -hmm. it is also because it's connected to predominantly Christianity and religion, where there's heaven and hell, there's the, the forces of good and the forces of evil. We like to kind of put things in those boxes but it's it, they it, it is sort of like it, <laughs> i might be going off on a tangent here so you might have to pull me back but it makes me think more of like if you are in a neighborhood where there's a heavy um mafia influence that can serve to protect you and they are keeping things in line but they can also be a, a real bad influence on your life it, but you know it's it's best to be on their good side that is actually a very apt modern analogy where they're sort of the organized crime of the other world where you know if you give them the right things and you're on their good side they are your best friend and they will keep all of the other bad things at bay and if you cross them well, you might wake up with a horse head in your bed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, okay. So, uh, any more that we can say about Pazu the 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 is it the King of the Wind? Is that correct? Is that what it's been associated with Pazuzu or or can, uh, King of the Wind demons? I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a number of different interpretations. Um, Pazuzu, there, there's some argument that like it's also representative like almost like the buzzing buzzing of insects or like the sound that a swarm of locusts might make hmm. um, which you know when we we read about swarms of locusts and they're not a very real thing for us now um well not until maybe 2020 where like things have gotten real weird on the planet but uh i don't know that we can always imagine that that was a real thing that people would have to see and, and that like that was a regular occurrence. So this would also be seen as like, what? how does this happen? Why does it happen? Well, clearly something is causing it. Um, and it's just, it's easy to have, um, th there's, a, there's just a human need that when we're in a situation where we have no control um, to create control, if, right. if for no other reason than our mental health, that, that it's a sort, sort of therapeutic uh, impulse uh, of humanity when faced with natural disasters and diseases 
when we feel helpless, we create a way to feel less helpless, even if that's not necessarily uh, like actually helping. It's it's making us feel better. I mean, uh, so so a lot of the magic back then that's that's what that comes down to. And and it also is the purpose that conspiracy theories serve today. That by having a conspiracy theory, it allows you to have control over a scary seemingly un uncontrollable world or topic um, it gives you a them yeah it gives yeah with them to blame to be angry at um to exonerate you from your not knowing how to handle a situation to exonerate you from the sense of helplessness that you can't change it um and, and that's really a theme woven throughout a lot of uh ancient religion and magic um, both of them, because because back then there's there's very little change, like very little difference between them. Uh, the other big demons uh, are a lot of them are gods from just competing cultures that were demonized over time, um, and and most of the big ones that we know, like Beelzebub, um, probably Asmodeus, uh, and several are actually words that became personified, like are seen now as discrete and individual entities. Belial is a great example. It just meant wickedness. The people of Belial uh, were depicted as basically the folks who were not the chosen ones of the covenant. And so they were wicked. They wore many colored clothes. They danced. They celebrated. Um, they were not the austere, sort of stoic, um, you know, Israelite people chosen in the co covenant of Abraham. Um, and over time, Belial just was assumed to be a being as opposed mm -hmm. to a concept. Mammon is another one, which is just greed, wealth, riches, the, the corruption thereof. And because Beelzebub and Asmodeus are pretty well-known names for anyone that's read enough comic books or watched things like Lucifer or even Supernatural at this point. Give us just a brief rundown on who those, you know, who those cats were according to their origins before we just looped them into the, the damned. Well, Beelzebub's a fun one because he's, you also know Baal or Baal, um, and they're all pretty much the same thing. So there were the, the, the Baals, and the Astaroths were the, the male and the female, uh, basically the lord and lady of, of several cultures in the ancient Middle East. And Baal Hadad was the, the lord of the storm. So, so Baal pretty much just means lord or god. Um, it's Baal. And if you are familiar with your like Old Testament biblical stuff, El Elohim is also a word that we use for God. It's translated to the Lord God. <clears throat> Notably, Elohim, although it's translated to singular God, is actually a plural. We won't even get into that because that's a whole bunch of mm -hmm. stuff to, to raise. So, so Baal Hadad was the Lord of the Storm. And the name is close, like Baal Zabub. Zabub is uh, it's a play on words. You know how when you're like a little kid and you want to give somebody a, a, an insult and you call them like, you know, Lord of the Shit Pile or Poopy Pants? Yeah. Bal Hadad, Bal Zabub. Zabub is about uh, the buzzing of insects around the dung pile. It's basically twisting the name of a god and calling him Lord of the Shit Pile, which is also where we get Lord of the Flies. Okay. <laughs> so, so it's it's these people who have one god and these people who have another god and these guys these don't, don't like this one, so they're making fun of him. And we've taken that name, and now that name is a demon, a, a great king of hell. Lord yeah. of the shit pile, Lord of the flies. It's, I mean, it really does elevate the your mama joke. Mm -hmm. it, <laughs> you're, it's, you know, you kind of, I, I feel like this is something we can all take away from this, not just learning about demons, but we could just step up our insult games mm -hmm. overall. 3,000 <laughs> years later, your God is God of the shit pile, yeah. dang it. <laughs> um, but, you know, we also have the, the, idea of things like entities i guess or 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 folk spirits folk deities like i'm thinking pan or whatever mm -hmm. which would take notions of that and that's how we get to basically the imagery of of lucifer and and um 
we were demonizing these other kind of folk deities. Yes. Um, is and um, wow, we can't even. I think just breaking down the origins of Satan slash Lucifer slash whatever name you want to apply oh, to. Oh yeah, him, there's there's so much going on there. That's a whole thing, but um, I had a question in there somewhere, but just that like these things, these the notion was was pretty much being wiped out once once Christianity was really over like becoming the the dominant religion correct like across the the Celts the across like across the world like Christian was Christianity was just wiping away these kind of blurry lined demons I mean to, to use the language of today Christianity colonized uh, a lot of other cultures and religions um, pretty much once the Romans, who were pretty much like the kings of colonization, mm -hmm. um, reigning supreme, and uh, once they became Christian themselves, uh, it was just sort of a de facto Roman approach to the world that if uh, if you became a province of Rome, you bowed to the emperor and you bowed to the emperor's religion. Um, originally, that was that the emperor himself was a god, and eventually it was that you became Christian, the end. Uh, now the Romans were really good at assimilation. Uh, and so what they would first do is go in and take any of the local gods and goddesses, and if, uh, gods in this case, because once you have just a, a singular male deity, it complicates things, but it's also how we ended up with the saints uh, as well as angels. Um, I mean, angels are a much older concept, but some, some things from local deities get kind of like folded into angelology. Because rather, if you go into a place and there is a firmly um, adhered to religious system and it's not causing any harm, the first and best thing that they would do is to just take the attributes and the names of the existing deities and fold them into Christianity. And if they couldn't add it to God himself, they would just make, uh, make saints out of people. Uh, Bridget is probably the best example. Um, the, the Celtic goddess Breed or Bridget. Um, gets this ridiculous backstory as a Catholic saint where she is the nursemaid to Christ because apparently somewhere along their travels through the Middle East, the Holy Family made a diversion to Ireland. Uh, Mary had to go away for a little while and so she left the infant Jesus with St. Bridget. In I mean, it makes to, a lot of sense to me. But 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 like it was a way of, of retelling yeah. the story, reframing the story, so because they couldn't quite demonize her. Now, now other cases where this was a potentially competing deity, and, and frequently anything male, uh, would get demonized, like just straight up. So so Pan and Cernunnos, um, the horned god, uh, Cernunnos is not the only one who loaned his horns to the idea of Satan um, throughout the ancient Mediterranean. One of the ways of showing that someone was sort of superhuman was to give them horns as a sign of virility. Uh, and, and so that became also now a sign of being damned, of being a, a, a sign with this. The forked tail is probably something that comes from the Egyptian god Set. Mm. Uh, who, who's well known for this weird representation called the set animal. We still don't know what it's supposed to be. Um, yeah, let's see. Ass, anteater, uh, ass as in donkey. Um, extinct type of dog. Like nobody's quite sure. It's got these weird cropped ears. It's sort of like droopy nose. Right. And this tail that forks at the end. Uh, and if you dig, like I did, through... Um, Ethiopic Christianity got cut off from the rest through for, for reasons that I go into in, in the book. Um, and they were heavily influenced by a lot of Egyptian mythology. And it's their writing is one of the places where you can see that Set and Satan and Sathaniel end up getting merged um, explicitly. Um, now, no, our word Satan actually comes, you know, it, it's in the Old Testament. And the thing is, is for the Jewish tradition, Satan was not an individual, but a job description. And it was a yeah. job description as, as an adversary, literally a devil's advocate, uh, that multiple angels and, and other things like filled that role. Um, and, and over time, again, once things shifted into Christianity and you had like just, just one God and good versus evil, you, you, you had to pick. Yeah. 
you know, the personification of devil of 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 Satan as a dude as a person was not something that was built in from the very beginning in the Bible, correct? Like it was like I'm thinking of the book of Job. Mm -hmm. The the devil that we had there was 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 actually when you look at it, it wasn't he wasn't he wasn't performing any mischief. It was God stirring all the crap up for Job, right? That was making things go wrong. But he was a challenger. He was a questioner. Yeah. So the, the angels of the Old Testament are probably or almost certainly uh, the surviving remnants of Jewish polytheism before monotheism. And the book of Job is one of the few places where you really see those remnants because there is that kind of iconic moment where the Satan walks into the council of heaven and God, much like Zeus, is presiding over a council of gods, Elohim, the gods mm -hmm. and the goddesses, uh, where again, we translate that now as a singular deity, but it's, it's coming from an older tradition. Uh, and, and specifically the book of Job, you see that this is, first of all, the Satan walks into heaven and has a conversation with God like they're buddies. And it's yeah. sort of like a bet of like, I bet you we can manage to like make this guy like, like we, we can test his faith. Let's do that. Um, and if you really read like, you know, letter by letter, literally that book, you get a very different idea of the relationship between God and Satan. And that's definitely the, the, the older origin of it. Satan as a role to challenge, a, a role that is necessary and that is part of God's plan, works with God. Um, and, and again, we get very, very polarized. Zoroastrianism gets kind of folded into things from there. It's another tradition in, in the ancient Middle East. It's where we get dualism, like this stark sense of darkness against light and good versus evil. And that gets coalesced in this fascinating, crucial period of time between about 300 before the Common Era and about 300 of the Common Era. So the 600 year cycle in the ancient Mediterranean and ancient Near East is where we get Messianic Judaism and the beginnings of Christianity. And obviously Christianity smack mm -hmm. in the middle of there, but there's a lot of other stuff going on. And then you have whatever the Essenes or whoever was at the desert of Qumran um, with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because in those scrolls, which we didn't uncover until about the 40s in, in the 20th century, there's where we get an explicit story of the war between the sons of darkness and the sons of light. And it's one of the first, if not the first places that you see that Michael is at the head of the armies of the sons of light and Belial is at the head of the armies of the sons of darkness. And so many of our concepts now come from that um, mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily ex explained in the bible like lucifer isn't even an individual person it's a reference to probably an ancient king and if you just take son of morning um and interpret that as lucifer there's a couple of points where jesus is referred to as the son of morning so uh, <laughs> <laughs> like one of the hard things about a translated text is you need to figure out like you can't just read the English. You have to read what it's being translated from to figure out like what choices did the translators make? Because sometimes those choices are very telling about their particular belief system, their lens, or the political agenda that they've got because the Bible was absolutely politicized. Uh, King James, enough said. Mm -hmm. Dude was sure that witches were trying to ruin his marriage. They were flying over the North Sea in sieves to to curse him and, and kill his wife and sink their ships. I mean, the man was special. Well, even even what we uh, is it's frequently I mean, it's great material for pop culture. Um, revelations is uh, heavily political mm -hmm. uh, uh, writing like it. it is very much referencing um a lot of politics of the day then. And, uh, but I, well, I feel like I don't want to go too much down that road. Cause I want to yeah, come back so to, much I, yeah, I, I could get into, I'm, I will say one thing about the book of revelation is Martin Luther founder of Protestantism questioned its legitimacy, thought it was a spurious book and really was in favor of cutting it from the Bible entirely. Hmm. 
I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, um, Pagels, Elaine Pagels, uh, Origin of Satan is a really good book to go digging around in. Also incredibly accessible. Yeah, I, I actually, I haven't read it, but I did listen to a great interview with her on, um, I think, uh, uh, All Things Considered or... Um... <laughs> <laughs> or an NPR, but she, uh, but okay. So this notion, I want to kind of fast forward 2000 years and this notion, okay, 1973. Yes, we have the exorcist. And then we also have in the same time frame we have um, Amityville coming out and we have Ed and Lorraine Warren who really are there. The sure we had, uh, you know, Harry Price before then, we had Peter Underwood and we had Hans Holzer, but Ed and Lorraine Warren become rock stars of this sort of paranormal investigative movement, these demonologists, and they did seem to find a lot of demons on their cases. And, you know, you were on Paranormal State. I know you work closely with Lorraine Warren and... I'm not casting aspersions on them, but how did they how did they influence sort of the scene demons everywhere in modern times? And and what was sort of your relationship with her with regards to that? Because that doesn't seem to be the direction you go as far as demons in, in, in your studies and philosophy. I've got two things to preface my answer with, and, and one is a, a law in science known as Hapgood's rule. You only find what you're looking for. And the other one is more anecdotal. If the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, so, so that said, uh, I, I worked closely with Lorraine. We've had, we had many conversations. Um, some of them were, uh, well, I would say polite disagreements, but heated. Uh, one of them lasted for like 40, 40, maybe almost an hour. Um, and I wish that that film wasn't on the cutting room floor because it was some pretty cool stuff about presumptions. Um, what I know about Lorraine, um, I can't speak to Ed because he had passed before I, I got involved with any of that, is, you know, she, she has a, a Catholic school upbringing, incredibly strict uh, and, and a very, very like locked into place worldview that is approaching psychic ability and the paranormal from an extreme Catholic background. Mm -hmm. Now, with the tools that she was given, you've got the spirits of the dead, which honestly, in some Christian tra traditions, is is a stretch. Uh, like, like in some Christian traditions, you you don't have spirits of the dead here. If they're here, they're damned, um, and that just presumes that they're demons. But so, spirits of the dead for Lorraine, angels, uh, which she very rarely talked about, or demons and and anything that wasn't human the only word she had was demon like there was just there was no other option so so everything got banged with the hammer um mm -hmm. and what i can say is with amityville i mean i grew up with that stuff on 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 camera and i watched the movies and i read the books and I definitely read the controversy where people were accusing her of, you know, faking and, and being just a disingenuous sort of person. Having interacted with her, I will say this. I firmly believe that she believed what she experienced and what she reported. Um, she 100% believed in her interpretation of those things and, and felt that those things were accurate. And that said she was working through a lens that I think was very limited. Uh, when every tarot deck is a portal to opening demons into your life and every Ouija board is automatically gonna summon the devil. Uh, I mean, first of all, that's a very terrifying world to live in. And it's just not how I experience it at all. Uh, I, I hate to say it, but I think many of their portrayals of the occult and paranormal um, if they didn't directly contribute to the satanic panic, they certainly became very uh, easy tools to, to help spread that, that terror that there were, in fact, these, these demonic entities that were in kind of a, a renewed witch craze out there trying to claim human souls. Uh, I, again, acknowledging the limitations of strict, literal Christian interpretations of the spirit world uh, where 
if there's a spirit, it's either an angel, a demon, or a dead human. And if there's a dead human, there's only a couple of ways they can be here. Um, because if they're not in heaven, obviously they did something bad. They're either in limbo uh, to be present or they're on their way down. And therefore they are also minions of Satan. Like it, the difficulty is the worldview from which they were working. Yeah. What do you, what do you believe? I mean, you've researched this, but what's your belief with regards to demons? Well, as somebody who's got a background in comparative religious studies from, from a scholarly point of view, um, I, I try to make a clear distinction between my identity as academic, where we're talking <clears throat> comparative religious studies and mythology and folklore and experience, because the scholar and the psychic are kind of necessarily separate from one another. Psychic is more about subjective experience and you know things I can't necessarily cite. From my personal experiences, I can see why there is a class of spirit beings people have no better word for than demon. Um, I have a very, very narrow definition for that, where for me, I do not think that this necessarily uh, is tied to a god and a devil or the sense of damnation or redemption. But knowing just the folkloric reality of this, this concept that's come down to us in our society, there are a few instances where I don't have a better word for what we're dealing with. But it has to be demonstrably not human. Doesn't seem like it's ever been human. Right. Um, operates in a, like a psychology that is completely alien to us. Malevolent, actively malevolent not just misunderstood, not so desperate to communicate that it's sort of like flailing and fumbling, actively trying to do harm. So non-human, malevolent, intelligent, um, not just kind of like clever, but like smart, cunning, the sense that this is something that is evil genius level of smart, um, old and patient. And then the final one is, for whatever reason, fixated on people. Um, usually in a way that is doing harm to them, uh, oppressing them, or actually trying to crawl into them and influence their behavior. And if those boxes get checked, I don't have no recourse but to go, we're dealing with a demon. Um, but it's important, I think, to clarify that when I use that word, I don't mean that we're dealing with Satan, or we're dealing with Lucifer, or we're dealing with a, a damned being. We're dealing with something that culturally we have no better word for. Um, and what does that mean? Heck, if I know beyond every once in a while, there's something like that out there. But let me please be very clear. I have been doing um, investigations and research and whatnot for God since the 80s. So however long that's been. And I can count on one single hand uh, the number of times where I was convinced enough for what we were dealing with that I was willing to give it that term. Yeah. So a very, very tiny portion. Yeah. It, it is, it's, it's something, like I said at the top, something that I struggle with as well, because well, not struggle with, but it's something I struggle with explaining and defining because I think there are a lot of, to just say heaven, hell, demon, angel is, feels pretty narrow in my in my opinion and so i think there's a lot of other possibilities out there but your classifications of you know so you think you might be a demon the ticking mm -hmm. off the boxes does actually sound though very traditional yeah. in the biblical sense yeah well and, and it's, it's judeo christian informed, sense yeah it's not just christian but it's informed by uh the sumerian and babylonian stuff that yeah. i've read uh and and honestly like all of the stuff mainly from the, uh, you know, what, what we think of traditionally as Western culture. I've, I've also delved into um, Tibetan Buddhism and Hindu beliefs, uh, the yokai and, and whatnot in, in a bunch of other places. I, I regret to say that I don't have a lot of background in most of the rest of Africa, not only Northern African traditions, because honestly, there's just not a lot that was available, um, especially academically back then um there's a lot more becoming available now but um there was a huge dearth of that 
what I can say from comparing multiple world traditions, at least the ones that I've had access to, is there is definitely an overarching theme that there are spirits that are adversarial to humanity uh, and that they are older than us and that they are more powerful than us, but they are not necessarily gods. Uh, and their origin stories vary broadly, uh, but at the same time, the sense that they're always here. Uh, one of the most convincing origin stories for like why there are demons and why they've got the problem with humans from a Christian perspective actually comes down to like three fairly obscure lines in a pseudepigraphal text called the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch is where we get the concept of, was well, not the only place we get the concept of Nephilim um, and the Watcher Angels. Uh, briefly, it recounts a story where there are angels that come down um, and mingle among humanity and they probably start off okay and they get kind of pulled in with sins of the flesh and whatnot and they have a couple of corrupting influences on humanity. They, they teach humanity things that were that, that humans weren't ready for, um, which weirdly include cosmetics and uh, forging weapons and armor and you know divination and magic kind of makes sense but like you know Basket weaving is also maybe a bad thing. It's 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 interesting that like civilizing them in a sort of Promethean sense is corrupting them. So bad things happen. Um, a judgment comes down from heaven, and the judgment is that the the watcher angels themselves are going to be like bound forever because they can't be destroyed. And then their children, who are sort of human angel hybrids, and therefore not entirely of heaven and not entirely of earth. They also can't be destroyed spiritually. So they are set against one another. They're killed physically and they can't leave. They're tied to the earth. They can't go any, they don't belong anywhere. They are aberrations. And these two, I think it's about two lines where they basically then linger on the earth forever, angry, jealous, and seeking to lash out at humanity for what they no longer have and how they're described as obsessing and possessing and attacking humanity clearly lays the foundation for our modern ideas of what demons do. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. it, it's, it's fascinating to me that like our, our concept of modern demons might actually just be the children of angels that are really screwed up. We see an echo of that in another text, the um, uh, Wisdom of Solomon or, or Testament of Solomon, which gives rise to um, the Solomonic tradition uh, of magic in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, and also in the offshoot with, with Islam, jinn. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I, the idea of sort of the hybrid, angel hybrid, angel human hybrids, and the, you know, the children of these. <laughs> these uh angelic figures that kind of went a little bit wild on earth i always kind of associated that with the if you're looking for sort of a bible story to explain things like fairies or mm -hmm. elementals things like that that it was in that direction but it would certainly explain this other sp entity spirit um that was stuck here and pissed off i mean to, to go to the fairy and elf thing um you're you're absolutely right because oscar wilde's mother was a folklorist um speranza and lady wilde like in such an offhanded way like it's it comes off like everybody freaking knows this she's talking about the the tuatha de Danann and the various elven folk and, and fairy folk of the british isles and how they are the children of the angels like, like she just straight up connects it to the book of Enoch and the tradition of the watcher angels and Nephilim without even blinking. Like she doesn't skip a beat. She just goes on to the rest of the folklore. Uh, so there's clearly a thing there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's, it's fascinating sort of the way it's woven in. It's, it's also important to know that in ancient Jewish tradition, one of the greatest sins, like, like one of the like punishable by death, bad things is to mix two things together. Uh, two different things. So, so crossbreeding certain types of animal, weaving a, a cloth of two different types of, of cloth um, is, is like, you, know, you can get stoned for that. Uh, so the idea of mixing 
angel stock and human stock is this abomination. Uh, and, and understanding that from the cultural perspective of the time, I think, is important as well. We, I mean, we're definitely over time, but if you have oh, a yeah, couple sorry, more I, minutes. I can, I can if no, you can tell, talk about this forever. I also no, no, like I mean, 500 freaking pages. If, if you've got like a couple more minutes, yeah. I do want to throw a couple other questions at you. Yeah, please, please. So, you know, when we look at the very, the last um, 18 years, let's say maybe a little less than that, since the paranormal reality TV, uh, the genre entered into this, this phase, the investigative phase. Yeah, we did have ghost hunters and we had paranormal state and then we had ghost adventures and so on and so forth. Certainly. And, and, Certainly, the idea of demons around every corner became good TV, yeah. and and it has and it continues. It seems to come and go in waves, but it, it continues. So, do you ever reflect on sort of you have this book, you have this sort of a a larger perspective on demons? You literally wrote the book on the dictionary of demons have you thought about how maybe your involvement in paranormal state opened the door as it were for this fascination with demons in the paranormal investigative genre i mean i'm going to say that that ship sailed long before i got brought on uh one sure. of the reasons that they pulled me on um lp and josh particularly was to have a different perspective um because I'm, I'm pagan clergy uh which i don't like trot out the like reverend doctor blah 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 because it just seems ridiculous uh, but they wanted someone who didn't have solely a Catholic approach to it and could offer counterpoint and also was a strong enough outspoken personality, I don't know if you've noticed, uh, who, who could politely but firmly say, so probably not Beelzebub, let's consider another option. Like, like let's take it from a different option. Mm -hmm. now, now, does it promote, um, you know, I don't know, armchair uh, demonologists it, uh, inevitably? but I'd rather they have access to a book that has 17 pages of bibliography where they can then go do more research to, to like actual credible scholarly uh, articles and, and, and papers and books than someone who's just going to sit there and only take a theological perspective because while that is one approach, it is a narrow lens. And, and I think even if you have a personal religious belief in this, it behooves each person to understand where those beliefs come from and how those beliefs were shaped over time and what pieces maybe you just sort of picked up and assumed were accurate because they were presented to you as matters of faith, but maybe should be examined a little bit more. Yeah. And I most certainly agree. And let me let me clarify yeah. with the book. I, I mean, I'm I'm so excited that this book exists and that you've done this because I do think, you know, researching, doing your own research and, and having the academic grasp on even though this is not a this is not a stuffy academic book. This is a very accessible book. But I think this is a great thing. I, however, feel conflicted at time mm. even with my own involvement in the entertainment component of paranormal tv and that is what it is it is entertainment about coaching in, not coaching but perhaps inspiring some people to think that there is a demon around every uh, corner and perhaps behind mm. every potential paranormal phenomena that they are experiencing. I think that that has, I mean, again, that ship sailed mm. long before I was on TV, but, but it, yeah, I mean, no, certainly. I, yeah, no, I, I, I do agree with that. Like it is, it is a concern and I, I cringe a little bit for shows that like hit that nail a few too many times, like where it's like every single yeah. opportunity. And especially one of the hard things with paranormal reality TV that I don't know that the viewers always are cognizant about is it certainly at the beginning was seen as an offshoot of the horror genre, that this is, we're telling ghost stories. And so when production companies and, and, and channels sort of are approaching this as horror, uh, it's about the scares. And there is some maybe unspoken pressure to sensationalize certain things. Um, 
And I do think that there's been an impact on people. The number of folks who reach out to me uh, about the Dictionary of Demons because they're afraid to buy the book because it's got the names in it and they are certain that that's going to invite something to their home uh, or haunt them or even get them possessed by reading it. Like like that it's some sort of necronomicon and you say klatu, baruktu, niktu and like, you know, terrible things happen. Um, and it's it's really hard to fight uphill against the easy pop culture portrayals. Yeah, which we know that by... Yeah, getting, I mean, even in the exorcist, getting the name of it allows them to defeat it. Knowing, not being afraid to say Voldemort yeah. takes the power away from Voldemort. I mean, He's not a demon, but he, same concept, basically. Yeah, and I mean, that's 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 scripture. The uh, Mark and Luke, the Gerasene demoniac, which, which you were referred to earlier, you're like, uh, it's where we get, uh, you know, our name is Legion, for we are many. Uh, the key part um, Jesus is doing his exorcism by the book in a way that the folks of the ancient world would recognize as something that the Asipu priests from Sumer and Babylon would have done, where he demands the name of the being, and then he casts it out in a more powerful name. So he gets the name of the demon, and then he invokes the name of a god. And that was a key part of exorcism in the ancient world. All about the names, the names with the talisman, and the 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 trick here was that there were so many um there wasn't just one name and also sort of having that sacrificial substitute because if you're familiar with the story he then casts them out into a herd of swine and the herd of swine go wild and go off of a hill and uh, you know off of the cliff and, and they all die that was another key part of ancient exorcisms the demons were usually moved from the person that they were either attached to or literally in and then put into either an, an object, an icon, uh, or literally like uh, a lamb, a goat, a goat, a pig. Yeah, a, a goat. A goat was fairly a common. Um, a scapegoat. Literally that, uh, and and then that animal um, was either ritually killed or or treated in some way to then harm the demon, bind the demon, or or ritually kill the demon. Because um, you didn't want to kill the person. Obviously, that was the whole point of the exorcism was to get the whole thing out of the human, and then push it into a proxy. Uh, and I have uh, just two more questions, oh, no, maybe I'm, three. I'm, I'm, but I will talk about this until you shut me up. So, so just you know, FYI. Well, I mean, we again we talked a little bit about the paranormal TV thing, and and there another trend is that people can pop up on there, or or God, I I see this like people presenting themselves as a demonologist mm. out there in a community and then even saying that they can help people i i'm and i feel like you already know where i'm going with this mm -hmm. help me break this down and help me help people out there get a sense of look maybe this isn't the person that you should be paying attention to well because this might just be a bit of uh uh tomfoolery going on um run language, with that language is powerful titles are powerful and in the paranormal there's not like there's really certifications for a lot of things i mean i can say i took demonology in college like and i think i may want be one of the only if not the only folks who's active in paranormal reality tv who has a like i can show you on paper scholarly background i can name the professor uh where this came from and i don't call myself a demonologist i wrote 500 plus pages on this. I have been reading through texts from the ancient Near East and Greece and all over uh, Christian Europe. And at best, I will call myself a demonographer, which is just a fancy word for a person who writes about them. Right. Because a demonologist implies an, a level of expertise I'm not comfortable uh, assuming. Because the more I dig, the more I'm like, there's, there's no way to be an expert on this topic. Uh, Demonologist also implies, in every case that I've seen someone assume it uh, as a title, they're coming at things from a theological perspective, and they are coming at things from a very specific uh, religious worldview, whatever their particular religion is. Uh, and my first caveat to people is, in the same way that you wouldn't go and get a therapist uh, or, or counselor who is just diametrically opposed to your lived experience, um, you know, say you're, you're LGBTQ and your 
looking for a therapist and you find somebody who's just like, you know, anti all of that stuff. You, you don't work with someone like that. They're not going to help you. Um, if your worldview is not strictly Catholic, uh, a Catholic demonologist isn't necessarily going to be able to help you. They're just going to see everything within their narrow scope. And that said, that presumes that the person didn't just read one book and say that they were a demonologist. Like we, our, our entire community, and it, it galls me to say, um, and it's not the only one where this is the case, is filled with people who watched one movie or read one book and decided that now they can teach on it like it's a master class, like they're off doing their little TED talks. And it's just, it's something that requires a lot more expertise. And I would say this of anyone, demonologist, paranormal investigator, psychic, whatever, check a person's references, figure out, like, do some research on them, look at their website, look at more than their website, get some referrals, because, uh, in much the same way as like the spiritualist movement a couple hundred years ago, 100, 150 years ago, uh, there are very genuine people working in this industry. And there are a lot of people who are really out for either the flash and dazzle mm -hmm. or frankly, the fact that they can make money off of it. Yeah. It's uh, calling back to your earlier statement. It's that when you only have a hammer, you see everything as a nail. But in this case, it's people that saw a picture of a hammer and mm -hmm. then assumed they knew how to do the carpentry work. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. No, and, and, and legitimately, like, if you believe that demons exist, first of all, and you believe that you're dealing with a demon, the last thing you want is somebody who, like, picked up a cross and some holy water. And that is that, that their extent of knowledge is going to be like the power of Christ compels you and like literally just trying to do the pea soup scene out of the exorcist because I've seen that. Like that is totally the extent of their understanding. And now they're a demonologist because they've been called. And it's just, it is a trickier thing to deal with than, than just throwing holy water or sage at it. Like that is not going to end well for anybody. Meanwhile, it, weirdly, I think scripted pop culture, like um, I'm a big fan of the Hellboy comics mm -hmm. by Mike Mignola. I feel like that's almost more the better way to go because in in those character representations, they're not just dealing with heaven and hell. They're dealing with all these entities mm -hmm. from all these uh, civilizations across millennia. And, you know, the character of Hellboy goes into a situation wearing uh, a, a talisman from various belief and basically saying, I believe in all of it. So I, I actually kind of like that that yeah. approach better, which I, I, I do, too. What's um, what is your. Oh, sorry. Go on. Yeah. Oh, no. Sorry. Oh, just your, I was with that as a segue, favorite pop culture, paranormal pop culture when it comes to demons uh, and how they've been represented out there. I like Neil Gaiman's Lucifer. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of someone who uh, battles demons and everything else, John Constantine is my guy. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like. Uh, no disrespect to the fans that are uh, that uh, people that are fans of Supernatural, but I always just want to be like, you know, before there was uh, Castiel donning the the trench coat, there was John Constantine. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah, there, there's definitely a callback to John, John Constantine with Castiel, as far as I'm I'm concerned. I mean, I can't say that. I, okay, so when when Supernatural first came out, it was like in the middle of filming for Paranormal State, so I never saw it like when it was first coming out, and I eventually kind of like went back to it. And I expected to hate it uh, and, and just find it unbearably cheesy. Enough people had called me Bobby uh, <laughs> that I was like, okay, I need, to, <laughs> I need to understand this. And honestly, especially like the first three seasons were pretty, pretty good. Like, and, yeah. and the writing was surprisingly good. Like I can see why it was the hit that it was uh, a lot of genuine heart from the people involved in it. Uh, so, so I won't diss it, but no. it definitely took a gonzo approach to the supernatural and paranormal. Yeah, just threw all the spaghetti at the wall. Yeah, which I actually do like about it. it it's yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a fun show. I think it was a fun ride. So, well, and finally, before I let you go, you do. So I mentioned this at the beginning. There is Inspiration House, which is a retreat center and Airbnb. Correct. I mean, tell me yeah. a little bit about the and it's and it's more than 100 years old as well. So tell me a little bit about Inspiration House. 
Okay, so so the idea behind it was uh, I don't do paid psychic readings for, for a lot of personal, uh, mostly ethical reasons. What I feel mo much more comfortable doing is teaching other people how to do stuff for themselves. Like, like I'm all about that. Uh, the trick was trying to find a, a good location where folks could be cozy, sit down, and ideally it was haunted enough um, that we could basically do medium training sessions uh, and spend some time kind of like, you know, casually looking for things. And this, this listing sh popped up on the market um, close to where I do uh, or used to do an annual convention. Um, hopefully, again, we will be able to do it. Um, and it was this 150-year-old uh, brick house that had been hand-built by this father and son carriage maker duo for the son's like new wife and everything. And it changed through a, a bunch of different families. Uh, and it just, first of all, it just was beautiful, um, redone, charming, uh, and you know, kind of ideal, you know, multiple bedrooms and everything. And when I first walked in, I was like, this place has a real interesting feel to it. And Realtors in some states have to tell you if there's been deaths on the property and if there's a haunting or anything like that. Not in Ohio, mm -hmm. but I will say that uh, the two ladies who were showing the house sort of very gently said a few things that seemed like, well, you know, not everybody's comfortable with the energy in this house and like, like a couple of things. And this thing had just been listed for like over a year. Uh, and there were some weird things about it, like the previous owner's had left everything like like the house was just full of their stuff it looked literally like one of them packed a bag and bugged out in the middle of the night um their prescription bottles were i mean like everything that you their taxes wow. were still there like everything was still in this house so i'm like so what's what's the story and why has it been on the market for like a year and a half uh and and they're like oh well you know things and it got to the point where i started to like go oh, did somebody commit suicide in this house? Because it's starting to feel like that. Long story short, it's haunted. Like it's, I, I don't like to go 100% on many things, but I am convinced the place is haunted and not in a bad way. But as hauntings go, it is one of the most physical in terms of activity that I've personally been at that isn't negative. It's just a bunch of old dead people who didn't want to move out. Uh, hmm. And they rattle around and they bang things and they, they, they walk up and down and they're very, very chatty. Um, and it was perfect. So uh, right before all of the pandemic stuff, so 2018, we closed on it uh, and started running, you know, had to fix it up a, a bit because it is, you know, 150 year old home. Uh, and I put in a display room with some haunted objects and a whole bunch of like things that I'd collected over the time. So uh, you know, scrying vessels and, and weird crystals and uh, paraphernalia from paranormal state. Uh, but the display room is a little bit less a museum and more uh, working on psychometry, working on reading like which of these dolls is actually haunted and which of these dolls makes you think it's haunted because it's a doll and we've seen so many images of haunted dolls. Mm -hmm. um, so prior to the pandemic, uh, we would do weekend retreats and work on psychic development, work on, on dream work, uh, do ghost hunts and try to communicate with the folks there and kind of like help people understand what that communication actually feels like versus the sort of things that we may project on a space based on our expectations. Um, I've moved a lot of my classes because of the pandemic to online. Uh, and so like my, my, my Patreon, patreon.com uh, slash haunted is where I do most of that, but I'm hoping to be able to get back in person with COVID, I'm not there personally, but we do follow the Airbnb protocol. So if people want to pop in and just do like a weekend ghost hunt, we have very limited availability uh, where they can just kind of, you know, rent the place and run and do whatever they want. Uh, I've got a big book of all the research and the death okay. certificates like uh, Oberlin is fantastic for keeping its records. So I've got records on, on folks that like go back from the, the father and son who built the place. Uh, the, the five or six different people who, who died in the house um, of old age. Uh, these, these were people that like loved the house enough. They just freaking didn't leave. Um, and oh, I just, just all the fun stuff. Any and, white squirrels on the property? Yes. Uh, occasionally. <laughs> um, also there's this, there's a black walnut in the backyard that was probably planted when the house was built. Uh, and it is certainly home to many squirrels, some of which are white because Oberlin has a weird quirk for producing albino squirrels. Yeah. 
<laughs> that's my main takeaway from having been there a couple, you know, for a few weeks at a time. But <laughs> um, the yeah, it's like, like we got the white and the black squirrels. Kent State has the black squirrels. Overland yeah. has the white squirrels. The two like really progressive hippie schools can just like have the battle of squirrels. <laughs> I like the white squirrels more, but the inspiration house people can find at it inspiration 36.com also on Airbnb look up inspiration house. And as far as Michelle's work, well, the dictionary of demons, you guys can pick that up. 10th anniversary edition is out and there's more than 200. Uh, you added 200 entries on there. Yeah. Well, th there's been so much more scholarship in the past 10 years uh, and a lot of academic papers. Uh, it used to be kind of frowned upon. Um, it's why I didn't like go into that particular topic for, for any of my like post uh, post stuff. Uh, and now it's popular. So there's there's new texts that have been discovered and, and uncovered and translated. So there was there was so much new stuff to add in. It was really hard to pick and choose. Uh, I added a whole bunch of more articles as well as a lot more stuff into like the Essenes and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, and there's weirdly an audio book. That's awesome. Which, Do you read it? No, no, I, I, I don't because... When, when the publisher was like, hey, we want to turn some of your books into an audiobook, which one, which ones would you suggest? And I'm like, well, probably not the Dictionary of Demons, because most of those names have, like, they're, they're written on a page. Like, nobody knows how to pronounce those. Some of them are solid consonants, and I'm 100% convinced that they are basically the medieval version of typographical errors. Like, like mm -hmm. they're not actually names even though they've become picked up and recorded as such. But um, the, the person who reads it's got a background in a couple of ancient languages, and I mean, she powers her way through it. Uh, I don't agree with a couple of the takes, but generally it's pretty good. Pretty good. If, if you're not going to be like filled with a kind of existential dread that somebody is now reciting each and yeah. every one of these 1,700 ent entries. like <laughs> It's definitely, <laughs> yeah, it's... Me? it's a good it's a good test like uh to see how how steely you are against the the superstitions of of demons well uh hey look and i'll also say you ever have another audiobook you need read you let me know i will cool. i will happily do it and uh to learn more about michelle's work and you most certainly should you can also visit michellebelanger.com that's michelle with two l's and belanger with one l and you can check out her glass, her classes, her books, her events on social media. Actually, I'm realizing I've never said this out loud. Seth Anakim or? Yeah, yeah Seth Anakim. Uh, it's, it's actually a callback to a tribe of angels that are tied to the whole Book of Enoch thing. There you go. And uh, as she mentioned, she also has a community at Patreon, patreon.com slash haunted. Good on you for getting that word. Right? <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, <laughs> you, know, you were like day one of Patreon when they launched. You're like, got it. I'm locking yeah, this down. Like, sure, this, this looks interesting. <laughs> <laughs> That's not taken yet. That's mine now. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Michelle. It, it, was, it was nice consolation because every variation of my actual name is parked everywhere, especially on Twitter. Like there's somebody in Morocco who's like M underscore Belanger. And I'd love that. He hasn't been active for like six years and yeah. just will not relinquish it. So you just, yeah, you, you should be able to re like possess it much yeah. like a demon might. Yes. Um, and, and, and let me just say, I, 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 I am so gracious uh, or so grateful for your time and you have been so gracious uh, speaking with me and breaking this all down. And it also just reminds me of how much I enjoy speaking with you. And I can't wait to do it again in person and hopefully at some sort of Comic-Con or event soon, you know, as we go back to hopefully a new normal. Yeah, once we get our Fauci ouchies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, this could this could be Joe Rogan length. We could go on yeah. for three hours about this happily. I would I would love doing it. But so that just means we'll have to do another one. So Michelle, thank you so much for your time. Thank you.